Um, yeah, so as David said, I'll talk about decision support tools for capacity management in liner shipping. And uh, my work has been done in part of two projects. Uh, first is the Green Ship project, where it's been working for one and a half year, uh, and it's funded by the Danish Council for Strategic Research. Uh, and the other part I started in August uh, on this project called RealCap that is funded by the Danish Maritime Fund. Um, and so I'll talk about some of my own work and also some work done by some colleagues, Dario and uh, uh, Jonas, um, th that has also been part of this Green Sheep project. Um, so just again, I'll, I will tell you about, it. they're not, it's prototypes, so they're not uh, all done and fancy yet. Uh, those decision support tools, but I'll talk about three of them. Um, and two of them has been done as part of, part of work package three of this Greenship project, which is Dio and Eunice's work. And my work is, uh, is another uh, decision support tool that has been part of this work package four of Greenship and also this new uh, RealCap project. So having that out of the way, I, when I tell you about these, I will focus more on the what and why and not so much of the how. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, but before getting into that, I will start with the telling you a little bit of why. And David did say a lot of it already, but let me just repeat it um, because yeah, David also had some graph, something like this, showing uh, the CO2 emission per ton mile for different transportation modes. And in this business within maritime, uh, the maritime business, we are very happy to see that. Uh, transporting things by sea, it doesn't uh, emit as much CO2 as the other transportation modes. And, um, but in order for this to be completely true, we need to use the um, capacity of the ship uh, fully, which David also mentioned. Um, uh, because there's a lot of uh, different container types, as uh, Dario said, uh, and the, the number of the different types of containers will influence a lot of how much you can actually put on the ship. Uh, so, yeah, let me give you an example of this. If we look at something simple like a truck, where there can be some number of standard pallets, then there is only a, a few reasons why we can end up not being able to put as many pallets in there as there should be room for. And this is if we exceed uh, the weight limit, if we put too many uh, heavy pallets on there, then we can't fill the truck completely. Or if we put some uh, high uh, pallets there, then there's not room to put a second one on top of it. And that's it. So that's reasonable symbol to uh, be able to manage this capacity. But for a uh, liner ship, it's much more complicated because how we distribute the cargo, it matters. If we have an uneven uh, distribution of the cargo, like this, where there's more on, on the back in the aft uh, than in the front, then this means that the, um, the draft, so how the uh, ship tilts, it will tilt a little to the back, and this could distort the um, line of sight here, and there's some rules to how long you are, you are supposed to be able to see. So therefore, we cannot put anything in these red uh, places, so we can't store containers there. And that's just because we put the heavy containers in, in the back, Otherwise, it would have been fine. But even more so, uh, Dai also mentioned this, uh, depending on which port we go to, it could be that these, um, the cranes that are supposed to take off the containers, uh, if the ship is too high, then the cranes can't get off the, if we load something onto the top of the ship. Um, so that also influences if, if we have some light cargo, we can't do this if we go to a specific port where this is the case. On the other hand, we can't put too much heavy uh, containers in if we go to a port where it's shallow water. So there's a lot of these things that influence how you can pack the um, ship and all these things that Dario talked about. So there's the balance of the ship and the stress forces um, and moments of uh, how the cargo is distributed, as well as how we can stow our containers that influence or actually reduce the available cap uh, capacity of the ship. So when we have all this, it means that uh, in, order, in order to have this green transport as we want, uh, we need to be able to manage our capacity. We need to have better capacity models. Um, and also, David also mentioned this, there's another green side to liner shipping. Um, if we look at this graph here, 
uh, we have some different capacity models. Uh, this one, the top one here, is by Feng and Chang. It's a very simple capacity model. It more or less corresponds to this um, to this truck example. So very few uh, rules of how to manage the capacity. Uh, and here we have a model that takes all these complicated details that Dio talked about into consideration. And what this graph shows uh, is the here out we have the uh, revenue. So this very simple model, it overestimates the revenue made. And in average, it overestimates it by 8%, which is quite a lot since uh, in liner shipping, we live off uh, marginal revenue. So a few percentage, so 8% miscalculation is quite a lot. So in total, we, we do need to have better management of, a cap, of, our, of our capacity in order to handle both green sides of uh, liner shipping. So I hope that, that now I convinced you, or maybe David did or Dayu did, that we need to have um, some better capacity models. Um, and so now we'll talk to you about the first one, uh, which is uh, service cargo mix analysis. Uh, and what this tool aims to, it aims to give an analysis of the um, optimal uh, cargo mix uh, in a, on a single service. So what we have, we have a, um, a circular service here and ship sails around on the service. And then we have uh, expected cargo flow. And by expected cargo flow, I mean that we have for, for an arbitrary port, uh, we, we know how much containers need to be um, shipped from, from that port to any other port. And this is uh, expected cargo flow. So it's something that has been ca calculated beforehand from some well, historical data. Um, so this is also, it's not a, it's not an operational problem. It's a strategic problem. So it's not like with the storage planning where the containers are given and we have to put this uh, on the ship. It's something that we can choose between what we want to put on the ship. Oh, and there's also some different uh, depth at, at these ports and all this that we have to take into consideration. Um, yeah, so since we have this freedom to choose what we should uh, put on the ship, the displacement, it's, uh, it's not constant anymore. And it's not even within that range that makes it possible to make a, a linearization as Dayo did. But instead, we can make a piecewise linear approximation. And I won't go into any details about that. And if you want to ask, I'll direct the question to Dayo. Um, also, we have uh, another challenge which comes from uh, block storage. And block storage is a policy that the liner streams have to try to reduce this over storage. And I also just told you what that is, you know, that you, you want to avoid having to remove some containers just to put them back on the ship because that takes longer time. It get, makes it more expensive. Um, so one strategy of avoiding this is to, um, to divide each of these sections, the base of the ship into uh, yeah, blocks where all the containers that go into one block, they need to have the same discharge port. It also makes it easier for the storage planner to then uh, make a storage plan. Um, so these two things we put in the mathematical model uh, that Dayo talked about. Uh, but that, yeah, unfortunately, it, it means that it's, it can no longer be solved efficiently. No. So what to do instead? Well, uh, we then use a heuristic <coughs> approach. Um, and the overall idea is that we divide the solution process into three parts, uh, where first we have, um, in the first part, we identify the block assignments. So we say at the ports, with, what are the discharge ports of containers that should be stored in each block? Uh, then afterwards, there's two phases where we distribute the cargo. So they, uh, yeah, into the blocks that we just decided how they should be. And so the second phase kind of first, it uh, distributes the cargo. Uh, and that means that the uh, vessel stability might not be correct, uh, correct. But then in the third phase, we use another uh, model to then move the cargo a bit around so that now it will be uh, stable. And then we get uh, a feasible solution. 
we have done some tests on this. Um, and this is just, well, it's the storage model that Dario talked about. Uh, this this column, uh, and this one is uh, the heuristic method that I just briefly told you about. And what we can see is that um, this, this storage planning model, uh, it has a time limit. Uh, if it gets a time limit of one hour, then uh, it can't solve realistic sized um, problems uh, with ports more than what is it, 11 or something like that. Uh, and also the values are not really that close to the, to the optimal values. While the heuristic, it solves, it solves them and it solves it quite fast. So this we can, uh, and yeah, it's, it solves it close to the real value. Yeah. So that was, um, that was the first uh, tool I'm going to talk about, then get, move on to the second tool. So this tool I just talked about, it's strategical for strategical decisions. This one is more um, operational. It's the name. It's also known as uptake management. Um, and here, instead of looking at a whole service, we just look at a service from a starting point, so the current place where the um, container is now, until it leaves the region, for example, when it leaves from Asia to sail to Europe. This is because we want to, um, this is the part where we care about well, mostly care about the utilization of the ship because this is here where it's going to go for a very long stretch. Um, so, but before I go into more details of what this tool is supposed to do, I'll just tell you a little bit of about bookings. Uh, well, Dio also already did that, but um, so because at each port we have um, some bookings and they come in three varieties. So there are some actuals. Uh, which are the ones that are at the port, they are actually at that port. So we need to um, transport them. Then there's the expected bookings, which is done by, well, it's based on some forecasting data. So yeah, what we expect to be there based on historical uh, data. And then there's the normal bookings. Uh, and normal bookings, they are sold by uh, an online booking system or by sales people. Um, and those, uh, Dario mentioned that those normal bookings, they are subject to no-show. Uh, so it could be that they just don't, they are not there at the port, they don't show up. Uh, and there's no fee for this, so yeah. Uh, and uh, in Asia, this is yeah, as much as 50%. Um, so an uptake manager then have to balance the available capacity of the ship such that, you know, the, the actuals, the ones that are there, they should be able to be put on the ship. Uh, at the same time, we don't want to have too much unused capacity due to no-shows. Um, for example, if we are at a port and we have enough normal bookings to fill all reefer slots, then in principle, this uptake manager should close for the sale of uh, reefer slots. Um, but a percentage of those normal bookings will not show up so it might be that this uptake manager will gamble and say, I will allow uh, overbooking like this because, you know, it can still fit in reality. Um, so this is uh, what the decisions that this uh, tool is going to help the uptake manager to find out where to gamble. Um, and so we are making a model that takes uh, this word until it leaves uh, a region into consideration, as well as the uh, currently available bookings. Um, given then that the, both the, uh, the normal bookings and the expecting bookings are stochastical, which means they're, they're not deterministic, so it could be that it changes. Uh, taking all this uncertainty into consideration, the tool is then supposed to find out what is then the optimal cargo mix. And so there's a little, you know, question mark. So it does supposed to do that magically, uh, but it involves um, doing making this tool. It involves modeling some stochastical data, and Yuna, Yunus is working on this uh, at his uh, stay in, at Georgia Tech in uh, visiting Professor Alan Herrera. Um, so I can't really say much more about what what this is, but Yunus will hopefully come back and and fill out this this arrow here. So it's pretty much a work in progress so far, so there's also no result page. 
but that means that I can get to so the, the next tool. So that was two tools already. Uh, now for the third tool, um, trade line cargo flow management. So this is uh, the work that I've been doing with, together with Rune. Um, so before we only looked at one service. Uh, now we have a network of services which I've uh, drawn here. So there's only two services here, but of course in real life there will be many more. Right? Um, and they sell from one region, for example, Asia to Europe. Uh, and also, as David mentioned, so because we have more than uh, more than one service, we have the option to uh, to leave some cargo, so discharge it at some port and leave it for another ship to pick up. And this might even be necessary, for example, if we want to transport something from here to up here, then we have to. Uh, get it to the next port where then the blue ship can pick it up and so on. But we also consider it uh, an option to do this. So uh, discharge some cargo so that we can put on some other cargo on our ship and thus get a bigger, better um, cargo mix. So we get a better utilization of our ship. So we consider this an option for this problem. Uh, what we then have is we have a, so it's operational problem. So we have a snapshot of how how do the containers look right now? What is on board? And we have uh, some, some cargo that should be transported from this region to the, that's that region. Uh, we also have some cargo from here that should be transported further. But we are focusing on how to best move this cargo through, through this network uh, of, of, yeah, of services to their destination within a given uh, time limit. Um, so if we name, we still have this uh, network here. If the, we name the yeah the ports that I've, as I've done here, um, then we can unfold the network in a way similar to what Henrik did. Um, so we get uh, this uh, time space graph here, where if we have if we just look at a single uh, round trip of both the blue and the red line, then we get uh, something like here, where we can see at at this axis we can see at what time. Uh, it is at a port, and on this axis we can see what port it is. Uh, and so here, for example, we can see that uh, both the blue and the red will cross this port, but at different times, which you can't see up here. Um, but this, so this, these routes are, are cyclic. So when the when the ship returns to its origin, then it starts over again. So we get a network like this. And also, as David mentioned, so because it will take some time between you start and come back, uh, there will be some other ships that sails the same route uh, in between. So we get some uh, this, this same pattern just shifted. And as, I, as I've said, we also consider the possibility to uh, transship those, uh, the cargo so we can leave something at a port uh, for the next uh, ship to pick up. So we end up getting a graph that looks like this. Uh, and it's this graph, if we want to optimize the, um, the revenue or the utilization of the ship, then we have this uh, graph and put it into our model. Um, yeah, no, we, we make this graph into a model. That's what I want to say. Um, and each of these uh, colored lines, so not the gray ones, but each of the color lines, they correspond to where a ship sails with something on board, right? That's how I describe them. And this means that the cargo that is on board the ship at that time, well, it will have to be able to be there. It will have to be stored in a feasible way. So at each line here, I will have to use a capacity model. And I can use the storage models that Dio talked about. Um, the problem is that they are very big and there are a lot of those colored lines. So for solving the overall problem, I have to each time I have this line, I, I use a copy of the storage model, which means that the whole problem will just be very, very big. Um, so this is not possible or it's not feasible at least. Um, so what I want to do and what this project or this part of the project aims to do is for each of these lines, we want to have a capacity model that is as accurate as the storage model that uh, Dai showed, but much smaller so that we can actually solve the overall problem. And so the idea is that we have the storage model 
uh, and it says how many containers of each type uh, should be or can be placed at each location. Um, and then we want to abstract away this location information. We don't care where the, we should store each of the containers, just how many in total can we put there. Um, and uh, then we get our capacity model. And so it means that for each, time, for each type of container and each location, we will have to abstract away some information. And what that means is we will eliminate a variable. So, and that will be at least, it will be hundreds or maybe thousands of variables that we have to delete, just so you know the size of this. Um, because, well, so this corresponds to a projection, if you want to talk mathy. Um, and uh, the good news is that there already exists a method for doing projection. Um, yay, but the bad news is that uh, it has double e exponential growth. And so as you've already know, so this model, it consists of inequalities and it's this number of inequality each time I eliminate something. So I get rid of uh, location information. I, I have the number of inequalities and then I square it. And I do that each step. And just so you can see, if I would start with just six inequalities, which is really, really, really small, then this is how it will grow um, up to a number after six eliminations that I can't even pronounce. Uh, so, and if I have to do this up to a hundred or a thousand variables, this number will be really, really big. So it's not really feasible. But of course, I'm still standing here uh, for a reason because we can do something about this. Um, first of all, even though the number of inequalities grows, there's a lot of them that doesn't give us any new information. It's already included in information of some other inequalities. So we can, each time we remove this uh, location information, we can uh, clean up, uh, remove the redundant parts, and we can also, we can divide this problem. I won't go into details with that, but the idea is that we decide the problem, uh, decide we separate the problem into smaller parts and keep some, um, yeah, remember how they are connected. Uh, then we solve the, uh, the smaller parts individually, remember still how they are connected, and then we solve that and get the result. Um, so as a result, we instead of uh, having this double exponential growth, each time the, these peaks are when I do one elimination, when I get rid of one location information, so it grows quite a lot. But then I clean up and I get down to something that is reasonable, you know, around the zero. So even though here I start around, I think it's 60 or 80 inequalities to start with, and here it gets up to 110,000 inequalities, but I still end up being able to reduce it and get something that is around 30, 40 inequalities. Um, uh, we have run some tests on different models. Uh, this is number inequality to start with, uh, variables. This is just to give you an idea of the size. And we get a lot smaller uh, models in the other end. But as you can see, okay, granted, we do spend some time on this, um, but I forgot to say that, but this is also fair enough that we do this, but because we only have to do it once. When we've done it, then we can put it into the model, uh, the big model, um, and then recalculate that a lot of times. But getting from the big model into this small model, we just have to do once and then we can use this result. Um, yeah. So this is the three uh, tools I wanted to talk about. And I, so I told you about some um, decision support tools, for both strategic and operational decisions, um, where first it, we looked at one, a single service and expected cargo flow and how to get the op optimal cargo flow from this. Uh, then we looked at operational decisions where first we look at this uptake management on a single service until it exits a region and take into account the stochastic um, <laughs> nature of the expected bookings and the normal bookings. And we looked at this um, network where we have more, uh, yeah, more ships and we uh, want to optimize uh, the revenue or the intake of the, uh, of, yeah, of, of how to uh, get the, cargo through the network and by reducing a big model into a smaller model. When we have these operational problems, we can also maybe in the future use this for revenue management because when we have 
When we do this, we find out uh, what we should put on the ship. So it means that we know what are the capacities that are left on the ship. So this we can use to maybe do some um, dynamic pricing of the different types of containers such that the ones that we already have room for, we can make cheaper so we can make it possible to, to sell this. And also, uh, on the other hand, if there's something that will make it much harder for uh, to, to pack the ship correctly, then we can uh, uh, charge more for that so we are sure that we can com compensate it for the extra cost. Yeah, Thank that's it. Much. Thank you. Any questions for Mike? Um, in your last project where you said you had to project this big solution yeah. space with a lot of constraints down to a simpler model yeah. uh, because then this simpler model can answer the questions very quickly whether there's space for container or not. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to use some sampling methods like in statistics so you just try to randomly generate a number of solutions here and project each of them and then guess that Perhaps it looks like this. So you don't need to have it. <coughs> so, 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 so this representation you have doesn't need to be exact. You should just yes. be sure that if you say yes, then there's space on board. The yeah, vessel. Yeah, yeah. But if there's was space for one more container, probably it wouldn't come. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that that sounds quite feasible. I, I, I haven't uh, I haven't thought of that. Um, but <coughs> of course, it, it's a matter. Of course, you say that it doesn't have to be precise. It's still something about the boundary, being sure that you are kind of on the boundary of, of <coughs> this feasible space. But, but otherwise, because this could at least uh, just guessing a solution and projecting it. It must be very fast. So yeah, 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 yeah. Millions of times, yeah. uh, and that could perhaps give you the boundaries of, of, of the solution space. Yeah, yeah. That I don't know whether that's feasible, no, no. but just <laughs> looking at your nice picture, I thought, uh, why not? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that sounds like an idea worth pursuing. More questions for mine? Okay, so that was a perfect conclusion. <coughs> so either oh. people have fallen asleep after the launch, or they just found yeah. it brilliant, so actually it's the last. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Thank you.